Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the News Agent Podcast. I'm Susie Lysett, Content Manager at Goodlord, and this is another webinar recording from our Renters Reform Bill series, but this time we're focusing on its impact on student lets. Uh, Goodlord's Director of Insurance, Ollie Sherlock, was joined by Sean Hooker, Head of Redress at the Property Redress Scheme, as well as Glenn Perry, the Founder and Managing Director of Zest Property. They all took a look at how the new tenancy system could affect student lets and how you can stay legally compliant and fair throughout this period of change. So without any further ado, on with the podcast. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this installment of the Good Law webinar series focusing on rent and reform. Um, hot topic still, and will continue to be for many, many months, I think. Um, thank you all for joining today. Um, my name is Ollie Sherlock. I'm Director of Insurance here at Good Lord. Um, I'm joined today by Sean Hooker, the Head of Redress at Property Redress Scheme, and also by Glenn Perry, who's Founder and Managing Director at Zest Property. Um, good morning, Sean and Glenn. Glenn, first, welcome to you. Good morning. How are you? Oh, you're on mute, I think, Glenn. Yeah, good morning, Ollie. Apologies for that. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> No worries. Give us a bit of background into Glenn Perry then, Glenn. What, what, talk, talk to me about your business and, and, and sort of your experience from a, a student and residential property perspective. Okay. Well, first of all, I should, should just say um, a landlord myself of student properties. And I set up Zest 15 years ago. We managed several hundred student uh, properties, um, also residential properties, but uh, a, a large portfolio of student properties. So this is um, something that we're obviously focused on. Um, right at this moment, like many others. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's going to be really interesting to get your insight, um, given that you're right on the coal face and actively um, operating in that market. Um, we're also, of course, joined by um, Sean Hooker. And Sean, um, many of our guests today would have seen you on these webinars. You've done a couple with us so far. But for those who don't know who you are, give us a, give us a short intro to, to Mr. Sean Hooker. Yes, well, I'm Sean Hooker. I'm Head of Redress at the uh, Property Redress Scheme, which is one of the two mandatory uh, complaint services that uh, agents have to be a member of. Uh, so we deal with complaints. Uh, we try to put things right. So that's basically what I do. But brilliant to see you, Ollie, and lovely to meet you, Glenn. I th think we've got somebody that might know what they're talking about in this particular. <laughs> I think it's, this is quite well, important that it, on this journey is. that we're all learning. It, it, uh, it is very learning. important. Um, um, and and we are all learning indeed. And I suppose that's the caveat to these pieces. And, and for those of you who joined multiple of these sessions, you may well get bored of me saying this, but I think it's important to, to highlight it. We're working on what we know now, right? Um, and this is a changing bill and a changing landscape. So um, these sessions are designed to hopefully inform um, of the current position. Um, but I'm also very well aware that um, in a year's time, you may turn around to, to, to me, uh, Glenn or Sean, and say, hang on a minute, you said a year ago that this was going to happen and it didn't. That's a very strict possibility, given that the bill is only at first reading. And that process will probably reflect on actually as we go through today's session. But we've got a long way to go. And of course, everything is subject to change. But thank you both for joining me today. Now, of course, these sessions really aren't about good Lord, um, although we do run them. They're really about trying to educate and inform um, our listeners and viewers on sort of the changing landscape within the letting space. But for those of you who don't know who Goodlord are, uh, we are a pre-tenancy process. Uh, we manage the entirety of the pre-tenancy flow. We automate it, uh, ensure that it's um, as regimented um, as it possibly can be for your business to ensure you can focus on the things that really move the needle for your business. Arguably, admin shouldn't and doesn't. Um, our services include everything from landlord terms of business all the way through to um, including bills within the package that tenants take um, and everything in between uh, from rent protection insurance to deposit registration, signing of documents and serving of documents. Um, if you want to know more about Good Lord and our platform, you can reach out to our website at www.goodlord.co um, and you can book a demo there. For existing customers on the call, there may be a few of these things on this list to the right-hand side of your screen that you may not be using. And if they take interest, please reach out to your customer success, uh, customer success manager and we can talk you through how you could adopt those for your business um, as part of uh, your Good Lord package. Um, that's all of it you're going to hear from Good Lord. Um, I promise, I think. Uh, for now, we, we, again, this isn't a pitch, Vagalan. It's about students and the renters' reform bill. And this is a particular uh, part of the reform bill that I think has been a bone of contention pretty much from day one. Um, the initial fear, as I remember it, guys, was that the risk was that the government were going to look at this bill and not really understand the nuanced differences between the different subsets within the lettings market. 
And it appears actually on the face of it that that's almost where we've ended up because um, it looks quite ring fenced in the sense that they've taken a certain view on um, purpose built student accommodation, for example, but not recognizing actually other areas of the market support students too. So those kind of areas, I think we've got some fears around. And, you know, part of the, the discussion today is hopefully bring those to the service, discuss them. Um, but also take the questions from the, the attendees too. And um, for everybody uh, attending today, you'll note the Q&A is open. Uh, as always, it's open through the duration of the, the webinar. Um, and we implore any questions. Um, please throw them at us uh, around any aspect um, of the of the bill. Um, and we'll try our very best to answer them. Um, but in terms of agenda, we're going to talk and focus uh, initially on the end of Section 21 and the change of Section 8. Um, we're going to talk about how uh, we can remain legally compliant and fair to students um, alongside um, what we know about the bill so far. Um, and we're going to close on talking about housing shortages for new students. Um, I mean, I think we could probably have an entire two hour session on housing shortages full stop. Um, it's been a long road to having not enough houses, frankly. I think we're all aware of that. But particularly, I think it's important to focus in this session on how that's affecting uh, the student market. What are we seeing at the moment and what do we think we're going to see as a result of the bill? Um, before we do go into that, if you go to the next slide, we're supported by Sarah uh, today, as always. Sarah is running the, running the show from a slide and tech perspective. If we have a dropout, uh, any one of us will try and rejoin the best we can as quickly as we can. Um, but but Glenn, um, I think I'll, I'll come to you first if I can. It would be really good to to sort of talk talk through the differences between purpose built student accommodation and other student other types of student housing because the bill itself does refer specifically to purpose built student accommodation. Of course, that they are ring fenced and they have and have different sort of rules and regulations. Just talk us through the difference in these two subsets uh, if if you can. Yeah, well, I think your slides capture it quite nicely, but ultimately. I mean, we see that those that go into other student accommodation, i.e. in the private sector, are those that have spent typically a year in purpose-built accommodation. So they've had the experience of um, being in that managed environment. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's quite a high-end proposition quite often. They are then seeking out um, a house that they can share with a communal kitchen and bathroom. Um, they are then taking on the responsibility of a shared housing environment, um, a shared joint liables um, agreement. Um, they, um, they are either working directly with a landlord who manages it or an agent who manages it on behalf of landlords. So they're building up those relationships. Um, but for those who are landlords and for those who are agents managing student accommodation of this kind, there is currently, as you pointed out, a seasonal predictability with the fixed term uh, tenancies that are currently in place. And therefore, it's a, a huge value to the student market to have that uh, predictability of availability of, of stock. I read a, a survey some time ago that um, said about 70% of students will still seek out private housing um, as a preferred um, accommodation. Uh, a lot of people were worried that purpose-built student accommodation would be a threat to the private housing that hasn't really borne fruit. I think culturally, that's what students want. They want this experience of living in this shared shared living accommodation. Mm. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a part of their evolving into young adults. And uh, so we need to look at how, uh, how we best manage this situation, undoubtedly. And we got a few questions are already in, um, specifically from 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 Ivor. Good morning, Ivor. Uh, he's been busy on the chat already, so thank you so Hi, much Ivor. for engaging with us. Um, he asks, what type of agreement do PBSAs so or purpose built student accommodation use, and can these can these be adapted for PRS student lets? Um, is there a different agreement they're using there, Glenn? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a good question. I don't think that it can be. Um, otherwise, that would be an. In, I, I, this might be a question. Uh, for you, Sean, to be honest. Um, but my understanding is that we can't just dovetail into that type of um, uh, agreement. That's my understanding. Otherwise, that would be a straightforward solution. Do you, do you know yeah, that? Sean? You're probably right. But uh, at the moment, I don't think that the government has even kind of uh, uh, thought about this transition. That's, yeah. that's my but I don't. I don't think it's an option either because um, by definition, we are not purpose-built student accommodation and therefore it isn't available to us um, mm. as, as an agreement legally. And, uh, and, and that's the point, right? The, especially <laughs> in the reform bill, it is really ring fencing 
uh, PBSA versus the rest of the market. Which is and why I we've think... got this distinction of these two different types here. And, and at the moment, uh, the purpose skills student accommodation is excluded from the bill. Um, and at the moment, other types of student accommodation is included, although it was, I think, important to say that, you know, a week after unveiling it, Mr. Gove was in the Telegraph and he did hint at the possibility of a U-turn um, in order to accommodate this part of the student market mm. because, of and, the anxi- because of the anxieties that agents and, and landlords feel. And, and with that in mind, um, Sean, um, Ivor also asks, um, when, when do we expect DLOC to respond to their committee reports provided in February? Um, he says the response was during April. Um, do we have any insights on that from your perspective, Sean? Right. So at the present moment, we know that the bill is going through Parliament. We know that it's had its first reading. It hasn't had a date set for its second reading, which is basically, for those people that don't know, basically it's the first opportunity that uh, MPs will have to debate the issue. It's usually kind of uh, a bit of posturing in that particular uh, 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 one where MPs get up and sound off with each other. The bit that where the, uh, the the heavy lifting will happen will be at a committee stage. So the committee stage is when MPs will scrutinise the bill line by line. So at this particular stage, uh, the 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 bill is as it stands. So it's very vague on a lot of the detail. So what's happening in the background is that the um, the civil service are still working on proposals. They they are looking at. Uh, um, uh, things that they will say that are they're empowering the minister to do so where it doesn't where, where the bill is silent they could put a power in say that uh, later down the line that they can uh, they can do the detail um they could also will be looking for things called friendly amendments so for example they get one of their own mps to put an amendment into the committee that could change this so that's one mechanism and of course you've got we are the opposition MPs on that. So I, I know that was a bit of a longer answer than uh, than, than Ivan, Ivan would have wanted, but that's why we are now saying, yes, there is still time to change this, but we don't know how it's going to change all the details. Mm. And on the second, the first point he's making, let's hold that thought there, because I think as we go through the, the webinar, we'll start to try and put some solutions in that may be practical or may not be practical in actually taking this forward. And any of these things that I can learn for today, and I and if I got the opportunity to talk to the civil servants or the minister, I'll certainly uh, um, be very vocal on that. Mm, indeed. And and just before we move on to um, the first gender point around sort of Section 21, et cetera, um, uh, Belinda, good morning, Belinda, um, asks... Um, there, there are licenses for student halls of residence, uh, Sean. Um, how is this managed in the Renters Reform Bill? And I think the point is that it's being reinvent, so it will remain as is pretty much. Um, is that right to assume that, or is there going to be substantial change yeah, around so, the license? So, so, so the, the, the purpose bill, the, the, the halls of residence, as we used to call them, which are owned by the universities and the, and, the, and those private providers that I have that special relationship and meet those criteria, they'll continue on pretty much as normal. Uh, mm. The issue is how how it does it adapt into uh, the private rental sector. Um, I certainly would be reluctant to see licensing as the solution for the private rented sector. I uh, think the protections that uh, the, the, uh, the, the 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 full tenancy gives, but that is really where the nub you know the nub of the question is because we are getting rid of ASTs, so they, yeah. this distinction is going to ch- change or not exist. Uh, you know, it's going to be difficult to see when what well, seals out the final. Indeed, indeed. And and Chris, good morning to you. Um, Chris is just checking, is this webinar um, relevant to normal residential lets, um, specifically around Section 21 and Section 8? This webinar is designed to focus really uh, on student accommodation for today, Chris. Um, I'd point you towards the other previous three or four sessions we've done on our news agent um, uh, uh, webpage. Um, you can find all of our content there, and we are doing more um, on the wider PRS, but we really wanted to focus today on students and, and bringing Sean's um, and Glenn's experience into the fold to discuss that. Um, so let's move on to the first agenda point. Um, so um, the end of Section 21 and changes to, to Section 8. Um, maybe, Sean, if you can start me off with from a, um, a, a compliance perspective, how will this affect the student market well i put this uh you know this this, this point up because uh it's a reflection of what the uh, um, what the compliance and the uh, the challenges that uh, student providers uh student uh, landlords face at the moment so we know up and down the country we've had hmo licensing 
Uh, and, you know, depending on what university town you are, they, they, you know, we've got to look at it on, in two ways. For many, many of our towns and cities, the student sector is a huge contributor to the economy, a huge contributor in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the not just accommodation, but all the services that it uses. It brings huge amounts of, uh, of benefits to a, a town if you happen to have a university. It also brings disadvantages, okay? And those in the, uh, in, in the sector that uh, will be used to the term student blight or uh, all the, the problems associated with it, uh, student blight would be where uh, um, a large number of students move into an area, and the uh, original residents, families move out and they're displaced out of that student area. The area just becomes almost exclusively student uh, with, with some of the disadvantages of that. Um, politically, uh, in the past, MPs have looked at that and gone, oh, you know, I've got residents, people who vote because your permanent residents are more likely to vote in your area than a student and oh, what can we do about it so over the years we've brought in uh, restrictions and we've brought in ways to try and control so local authorities have brought in hmo licensing um and you can have a designated special licensing for special areas which will limit or uh, control the uh, the the amount of, uh, of student accommodation uh, in certain areas, it will exclude so that you don't get uh, the, 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 the student creep that you do in some cities where, it, you know, the city centre suddenly starts to creep out. You've also got the planning for um, planning, um, um, planning rules, Article 4 in particular, where you can you can you can restrict the student accommodation because of the way that it is built and put put more. Uh, you need, need planning permission to convert properties into uh, into uh, purpose-built student uh, accommodation. And then thirdly, I think it's, it's this move now to, to, to uh, the alliance with the purpose-built, especially the private sector, of uh, build to rent specifically for, uh, for, for students. And uh, we were at the Property Mark um, conference uh, last week, well, I don't know if you noticed all those high-rise properties. Uh, as you Wembley, well, Wembley's in changed. Yeah. Wembley's changed significantly yeah. in the last 15 years. all student accommodation and yeah. it's all kind of like, they purpose built, uh, you know, units um, and, and, you know, but the planning, app, uh, planning uh, permission is a way of restricting that. Um, okay. I don't know and, if Dan wants to talk about the six months up in advance, but I think this is going to be one of the most controversial bits of the year. Uh, yeah. And, and before we do, I just want to sort of get a handle on um, how, the importance of this in, in your view, Glenn, because, you know, we know that Section 21 has been the biggest talking point, even from a survey we, com we completed only weeks ago. It continues to be the biggest worry for landlords and letting agents, but we we tend to gravitate to the PRS as a wider uh, as a wider piece rather than focusing on the, the more nuanced side of, of student rentals. You know, when we were doing those surveys, um, just just give me your insight in terms of how um, how frequently you're, you're utilising, say, Section Twenty One, because it's a different type of tenant, different type of let, different type of dynamic, and how um, and how much of effect you think this really has in terms of specifically the removal of Section Twenty One on your student landlords and you as a landlord of student property. Yeah, so we we don't we don't use it. It it doesn't have a place for us with student accommodation. Mm. Um, genuine, gen, literally, and I, um, and this may be different in different parts of the country. Um, but where we are, we genuinely um, the fixed term that exists for, for a student uh, household, whether it's eleven months or twelve months. Um, this is something I was talking to my team about. You know, like they are legally liable to give. A month's notice ultimately um they never do but they leave every year um you know their attention to detail on their legal obligations is another thing um you know we give them a huge amount of legal documentation yet we're trying to educate them on the basics throughout their tenancy and the the various aspects of the legals is something that they're not always on top of and they certainly don't give notice at the end but they leave um and that may be different in other parts of the country. So I'm only saying for where I am, which is in the city of Bath, um, maybe that's less desirable for people to stay. I don't know, um, although it is a beautiful city. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, that it just doesn't come into play for us, particularly. 
that's that, that that was my thinking uh, as per the question because I think we can we can easily conflate the the, the two different sides of the of the industry and think it's going to affect you know um, on mass everybody and and I, I, I my guess was that student landlords would would feel less precious around the removal of section twenty one. Um, that would be anecdotally how I think it is. Yes, that's interesting. And in terms of the um, the major concerns, then when we think of reform from the landlords you're speaking to, Glenn. What what's at the top of that list then? If it's not Section Twenty One, what do you think it is? Well, I think well, you've got one thing on the slide here, which is signing tenancies up to six months in advance. So with this, I think what student landlords have become used to is there's a security for landlords. Um, there's a marketing of the property well in advance, and therefore there's the se- securing of tenants well in advance. Um, Operationally, it's a huge operation, whether you're a landlord managing it yourself or whether you have a specific student agency managing it for you. One of the things that um, the, to consider actually a two month window of marketing, finding tenants, um, doing all of the legal background work, multiple guarantors, um, as well as then coordinating with inventory companies, cleaning companies, Operationally, it is a huge anxiety for an agent and for a landlord. Um, how that can be brought together in that small period of time when operationally it's been structured over a number of months, historically, that's a huge challenge um, and a source of anxiety, I would say. And and Sean, this is this is you know highlighted um in previous conversations with yourself and, and indeed today as the Probably the most one of the most contentious points of this of this change, and and I think Glenn, you really speak to the operational challenge there of of, of going from what we, we're used to to then seeing the other side of the PRS that isn't purpose built being affected by the reform. Um, can you speak to us what, what your views are on on, on the effect of, the, of these changes? Well, I mean, on the signing of the tenancies up to six months in advance, I mean, uh, with a previous hat of mine, and it's still part of the uh, Hamilton Fraser Group, uh, I. I I, I was there at the uh, the inception of a uh, deposit protection, uh, and uh, you know, literally set up the dispute service with a, with my great team here at uh, Hamilton Fraser and my deposits, and we set that up from scratch when they introduced that legislation. And to be fair, this was one of the the, the early headaches about uh, uh, on the on how to get the conundrum of this signing of, of the. Uh, taking the deposits up to six months in advance we muddled through that and i think we are a good place there but i think uh, glenn if you, if you were around at that time and many of your viewers and listeners will be um will be will, will remember this it was it was a royal pain in the backside to try and find a solution on this i think we're going to have a similar thing when this we transition into the new system but i think we it, we will find a way of of of, of, of resolving it the student sector is different OK, in, in any other kind of part of the private rented sector, you know, signing a contract that much far in advance is is normally frowned upon. Um, that's but it's the only way the student sector can work because of the logistics of getting that window of preparation that you need to do it. I was up in Durham when I first was my deposit. I saw the queues of the kids with in cash at that time before well, they all had little bank accounts to do it and literally were handing over the first month's rent and the and and the deposit and the logistics of getting that done uh you know are huge in the sector and that has to be appreciated it's different it's different to the to to uh to other parts of the sector mm. and and a lot of businesses have worked really really hard to nail that process the best they possibly can and it's maybe fair to argue that it's not entirely broken versus other areas, uh, areas of the industry. Mm-hmm. And you know these changes actually set us backwards because the failure to recognise um, student accommodation outside of the PBSA remit feels like a, a big miss. And this this was highlighted, Glenn and Sean, well in advance, really Absolutely. early days yeah. of the white paper being released or before the white paper being released. And it it seems odd to me that only weeks into the white paper being released, I think it was literally weeks, we had comments from um, DLUC that, hey, we should probably look at this. And it's like, well, there's been plenty of people telling you to look at this for from, from a long time. So I think there's a general frustration with this point in particular that, you know, that, that there is little little sort of certainty being provided, albeit soundbites say, oh, well, we recognise there are differences and we recognise we should probably look at this. 
it's still not apparent to me that the bill does that, that the bill seems to be in line with what they said in the white paper. And I'm yet to hear anything to the contrary of that point either. So um, I can imagine this is causing quite some frustration for businesses like yours, Glenn, in terms of knowing how you're going to actually act and how you're actually going to be able to serve both your landlords and your tenants, which let's remind ourselves the very point of this bill is to benefit tenants, which I think we're all aligned with you know, giving tenants a better process. This is taking them backwards, isn't it? Absolutely, Ollie. And clearly, you know, someone once said around innovation, innovation is there to make things better, easier and faster. This does none of that within this sector. It does bring it backwards. Um, and, you know, in my opinion, it therefore is not innovating to serve. And for the students, like you rightly point out, all it's likely to do is to cause further anxiety amongst a cohort of the population which is already suffering mental health issues far greater than ever before. Um, so, and, and that's going to be compounded by the fact that um, even though we would, if this does go ahead, find a solution, like you say, Sean, we'll find a workable way. We always do. Whenever legislation comes in, we adapt to change, don't we? And that's what we're here for. Um, however, perception-wise, an appetite amongst landlords to remain in that market when they have been squeezed in many other ways um, historically over the years, I do think it's going to be a problem. I do think it's going to have a ripple effect on the supply. Um, and that's going to have a massive effect to students who are already clamoring to try and access accommodation, which is there is not enough of. Mm, indeed. And Linda um, asks, good morning, Linda. Um, I hope you're well. Um, but surely without a section 21, the student can give notice um, after their nine months academic term. Therefore, the 11th or 12 month tenancy may be reduced. Please comment. I think um, I suppose in, in, in the new world, Linda, where um, the reform bill is being applied to those non-PBSA uh, tenancies, um, this is indeed the risk that there's there's notice given, but the landlord has no certainty of that, but also then can't serve the future um, tenants that would normally take those and align those with their with their academic year. So I think one of the calls at the moment, and and both Sean uh, and I sit on the the Lessing Industry Council, is to have a fixed term proposed for for student accommodation of of either nine or twelve months to give that certainty. Um, and ideally, I think it's better to say giving a choice of those two things because you know we're well aware some landlords will rent the properties out over the summer months whilst they're empty for other purposes. Um, so I think you know the main point here for me, and, and, and interested on Sean and, and Glenn's point of views here is having access to property. Uh, we're going to come on to housing shortages at the end of this webinar, um, but I think we're all aware there's just simply not enough property. And anything that is is you know forcing or even guiding landlords to think again about doing what they're doing in the current sector, I think is super, super dangerous. And um, I don't recognise, Glenn, that, this, that the student market's getting any smaller from a demand perspective. What are you seeing from a, a demand perspective from students? No, absolutely. The demand is is growing. Um, the numbers at universities that I'm seeing are still growing. Um, and the supply is at times diminishing. So um, I think this will only, like I say, threaten that. I'm interested in the point you raised about uh, what, what you're looking at, Ollie and Sean, around a potential nine or 12 month fixed term um, scenario. Is that, would that be a nine or 12 or would it be one or the other? I think it, to be fair, it's it's about kind of because we've we've we have this unique part in the uh, in the student rent where you get to the end of the academic year, okay? Uh, you the, the student has paid for the equivalent of a whole year, and then but you say then well you've got to leave. The reason you want to leave is but basically either you want to actually get uh, income from another source, say uh, for a holiday let or uh, um, a lot of um, a lot of. Um, uh, uh, conferences and things happen at that time of the year but equally many many of you as glenn you'll bear this out want to prepare the property in time for the next one and because all you know if you don't have that mm. summer months into which to prepare it and the, the students are leaving literally two days before the next uh, academic term you haven't got a hope in hell of getting those ready for it i mean that that needs to be uh, accommodated so do we look at having nine months but higher monthly rents because at the moment, under the uh, under the legislation, you know you are guaranteed that uh, you know six months in the property, and then you can give month, uh, um, a, a month uh, two months notice. So you, you could 
circumnavigate that anyway and leave the, the landlord out of pocket for those summer months. Yeah. But we've got to have to look at some creative solutions that are yeah. legal. Yeah. And I think that's the, you know, that is that, you know, because when you look at the detail of the of the of bill, that's the implication is that basically, you know, most students can, can serve you the notice and leave you yeah. high in life for the summer. Yeah. I mean, I think nine months, um, the problem that poses, obviously, there's the revenue for the landlord, but then also for some students, there's a good, um, we would say, 50% of our student clientele remain in the property for longer than nine months because they have jobs. Um, they may not have a home to go back to. Um, so there is the effect there, that end. Um, also, the 12 month scenario, like you rightly point out there, um, Sean, is, is an issue because you can't do a turnaround in two days, especially if you want to elevate the standards of student properties, because periodically you need a, a larger window, which is why we gravitate, we, 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 we diversify between nine and 12 month tenancies, mm. dependent on where that student accommodation is in its cycle of repair. Um, because we need to be able to continue the elevating of standards of student properties, and we need a maybe a two month window to do that sometimes. And and this goes back to to, to the point uh, I suppose Karen is making. Good morning, Karen. She says I thought this bill was stopping fixed term tenancies, um, fix, fixed terms on tenancies, and indeed this is the point going. It is, and it's going to affect student accommodation. Um, and it's not intended to, but it, but the unintended consequences, in my view, without it being thought through, of how much student accommodation sits outside of PBSA accommodation, it means that actually um, there's going to be a dramatic effect on on how not only the logistics of the student market work, but also the prices that they pay. And Grant, Good Morning Grant makes a good point. Surely by pushing for a nine-month fix, that will force landlords to push up the rents. Yes, it may well do, but yeah. we have to have a workable solution. I think looking Absolutely. at something as a minimum of nine months and then having maybe flexibility thereafter. Now, what we're not saying here is that this is what's going to happen. What we're saying is this is what we're lobbying for, and this is what we're suggesting is change, because at the moment, the current framework um, I just think is unworkable, and it's going to really impact both landlords and we should care about that because it affects the tenants. And I think we are slowly seeing the government, um, and I think we're seeing the potential new government as well, listen. Um, and credit where credit's due, I think they're listening more now than they have done before, that actually you know, looking after landlords is actually important. It might not be popular from a vote perspective, um, but it's absolutely vital in an area where we're not building enough houses, whether that be for students or for the PRS. So we have to look after what we've got. Um, in terms of the um, the rent for non occupancy periods, we, we see different levels of activity, which I think you both alluded to, and, and different landlords, different properties, different cities have different demands. You know, if you're if you're a coastal um, university city, for example, it's very likely that landlords are wanting that summer months back. They can rent it out from an Airbnb mm. perspective. They can make a bit of money out of that and get it ready in time, according to their own sort of diary, as it were, to get it ready for the new student letter. For other cities, actually, people want con continuity there. And as you say, Glenn, that puts stress on getting the property back, you know, ready for the, the, the next cycle. So even in today's world, there's no perfect um, sort of system, but one that is at least structured. And I think that's the fear with this is that we lose that structure, we lose the control, which mm -hmm. ultimately ultimately is bad for bad for tenants. Mm -hmm. um, if we can go on to the next slide, please, please, Sarah. I'm conscious of time. I want to make sure we're, we're sort of covering all of the, all of the points. And I do appreciate we've had a couple of questions come in, um, more than a couple actually in the last few minutes. So I will I'll come to those shortly. Um, so. In terms of remaining compliance and, and fair for students, and, and and you'll note the wording there, that's that's the aim, right? We want to make sure that we're treating students fairly and actually, you know, uh, unbeknown to them, maybe what's happening behind the scenes, as we've already alluded to, is that legislation is potentially changing, which makes their life more difficult. And um, somebody in the in the in the question set, forgive me, I've, I've, I've misplaced your name. Um, majored on your point then around mental health and being it was Steph actually uh good morning Steph Steph note mentioned that actually that's at the additional stress of exam season as well and you know, they're actually there to do a really important thing uh, and this could make life more difficult um so we want to be fair to students but also there needs to be fairness back to landlords and Sean what's your thoughts on there being a ground for possession specifically for student lets does that alleviate pressure somewhat well put it this way I mean I when I we were preparing for this I, I thought to myself, well, look, look, you know, one of the challenges of this uh, of getting registered section 21 is to come up with the sufficiently robust grounds in order to be fair on the land or to get uh, their property back when they genuinely need to do so. So they're talking about, of course, um, if you want to sell that property or move back in. 
would this not be a simple a simple uh, uh, answer? Just put a ground in that you can serve the notice to regain a property that was being used for academic or student use. Would or am I being naive? Are there lawyers out there that's, uh, that will say no, that's not workable, and these are the reasons why? So this could be a solution of putting that in a, a ground uh, that you can put in and and serve that ground. You're two months before the at the end of the term uh, uh, or the term you want to get the property back, and that in the worst case scenario would be mandatory for for judge to uh, uh, to to grant you possession. So, so essentially, section twenty one reincarnated, but just for students, which gives that level of flexibility. Gives the reason being for the student let, and I said it seems too simple to be. What's the problem with it? That's what I, yeah, well, I agree. I, I agree. Well, Sometimes simple is best, but yeah, what is the problem with it? Yeah, hmm. right. and and I think that's that's sort of the point here is right. We're in this phase, and and I think it's a really good segue to, to remind people of where we are in this in, in this build process. So we've we've had the white paper, we've had the bill that's been presented to um, the House of Commons, and we've had the first reading. Although the first reading was literally calling out the title of the bill, uh, no debate, unfortunately. We're due the second reading of the bill. There's three readings that go through the House uh, House of Commons. There's a further three readings that go through the House of Lords, um, and then it's passed through for, for royal assent. So we've got a long way to go on here, and I think it's it's really important to urge um, everybody that has a a vested interest in this, whether whether you're you know your parents with somebody looking to go to university or at university, whether it's a business perspective, um, please do speak to your MPs. And we've said this a number of times, um, Sean, uh, in previous webinars. But it, it it can make a difference, and it may feel futile at the time, but there is time to to challenge some of this and, and try and change the direction. Um, and I think it's vital important when there are some levels of simplicity um, um being provided here like this point although you know sean it may be maybe a bit of a struggle to, to sort of get this through i suppose on the basis it feels like well we're not really changing anything but there's the point yeah. the student market is very different to the rest of the prs um um glenn in, in your experience um, how many of your students are paying rent in advance what, what's kind of the spread that you see mm. It's very small, uh, maybe 2%. Um, it's a very small percentage. Um, normally, we have uh, UK-based guarantors, which um, are the security that we need. Um, if not, there are guarantor schemes, which um, students can apply to. Mm -hmm. um, very occasionally, international students uh, will be paying in advance. Um, obviously, that rent is um, secured in a ring fence client account um allocated to that property um so we um yeah we don't see a lot of it i'll be honest it's not a it's not a big thing and and this is very much a um a geographical point isn't it i think because you look at other other, other cities and you see quite a quite, quite a um you know high percentage of, of students paying rent in advance depending where they're coming from what their backgrounds are you know what they're studying etc um so this is very much a nuance across the country but but sean paying rent in advance is a question mark over the entire um bill because rent is defined in the bill uh as essentially one month's worth of rent um and therefore paying rent in advance actually if you know, if you read the bill um would somewhat be prohibited now we had ryan heaven from dutch and gregory on uh on one of these webinars um a few weeks ago and we were suggesting on that call that maybe there's a way around that in looking at rent credits um so essentially you do pay your first month's rent in advance but you you're paying another payment which gives you that luxury of rent in advance but you know clearly this thinking isn't quite joined up yet and it certainly hasn't been stress tested um, what do you see the effect of this being, you know, sort of putting your, your sort of PRS hat on and, 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 and your insights into the student market? What do you see the effect of, of, of restricting payment advance if indeed that's where we end up? Well, as I say, it is very regional. I mean, so down in London, central London, uh, you know, the, the number of overseas um, students that, uh, that, uh, that those universities rely on. Uh, a lot of them, uh, I remember way back uh, again when I was doing the deposit scheme, uh, we, we were contacted by the Saudi embassy and uh, to, to, about how do they protect the deposits because they want to pay rents up front, uh, large rents up front. It, you know, essentially, this is going to either, and I, I'm very reluctant to say this, is either going to be disregarded in certain circumstances where it's mutually acceptable to people or it's going to need to have a solution 
uh, in it because someone will challenge it and mm. it, it will throw into, uh, into, into chaos some of the business models that some of the universities are relying on. So it needs to be addressed. I personally, uh, you know, I don't think that taking large amounts of rent up front for any purpose is the best idea uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, for a landlord model. I think the guarantor model, I think um, uh, um, making sure that, you, you know, that there is affordability um, criteria built into your systems when you are taking it. If you, you know, for example, you know, if you're t- taking rent because you don't think they're going to be paying it, then maybe, you know, they shouldn't be taking that property. I know it's more difficult in student uh, in student accommodation because they're not earning and they are relying mm. on grants, parents, etc. But I think generally the move to get rid of paying large sums of money in advance is a wise idea and other solutions need to be taken in. But with the student and these niche parts of the student market, a solution has to come. I, th- I think, you know, I, I understand your points in terms of, of being I- idealistic, I suppose, on, on that upfront amount of cash, for example. But the reality is, you know, there, there's a, there's difficulty sometimes in tenants showing their affordability, showing that they're good for the property, but they do have the reserves and they do have a grant, et cetera, that's going to cover that depending from where, where they're from. And, and Chris, good morning, Chris, there's about 20% of our students pay in advance. Um, the provision of this will disadvantage both international students and those from poorer backgrounds. I couldn't agree more with Chris's point. And, and again, we, we have to go back to the common thread of why the bill is being enacted. It's being enacted to really give a fairer rental space for tenants. And if it's not doing that, I think it's absolutely right we question it. Whether it's our ideal or not, I, I absolutely accept, Sean, you know, in a perfect world, we could find other ways around that. But, um, you know, th- this, this I think, is a, is a real fear and one that, you know, our attendees and listeners today are, are hopefully still watching and, and, and thinking about how it would affect their business because most of the points here um, that are coming up um, from, uh, from Chris, uh, from somebody who's not left their name, um, you know, are really citing um, this will just reduce access to property. And I don't think that's what any of us want, um, especially when somebody can really? clearly, clearly pay pay the rent. So one to watch, I think, um, it is one of those points at the moment that we don't really have much certainty on because we don't really understand the mechanism that we've been enforced. Um, you know, should we want to take rent up front? Um, I think we've touched on leaving a tenancy early or late. We've kind of covered that in, in the previous slide. Um, but do you want to touch on antisocial behaviour? Because um, part of the bill does actually give um, accelerated powers for antisocial behaviour. Um, and uh, there's a question um, coming in, actually, uh, on the chat here, if I can find it. Um, if from Emma. So uh, uh, Emma says, why do you think the government has allowed for exception of the PB student accommodation, but not other types of student accommodation? Um, and this feels a bit of a side point, but really, I think, Emma, it's because they've they've not understood how the two bleed um, into in, into one another. Um, and actually, it's quite hard to define anything out of PBSA. So essentially saying, hey, I, I know what they are. I definitely know they're for students. Let's do that. The challenge the government has, I suppose, is saying, well, how do I prove something else is a student accommodation? I would argue linking up to services, council tax, et cetera, gives you good insight as to who's in the property um, yeah. and, and what type of person's in the property. But that's really the major, major sort of challenge there, Emma. And actually, to that point, um, because the reform bill covers you know, the other side of the industry that isn't ring-fenced at PBSA, um, it would also encounter the new antisocial behaviour clauses, wouldn't it, Sean? Which um, are, are extremely broad, one would argue, uh, in this current time. Talk us through what it's saying, because the wording on antisocial behaviour, as per the bill is, uh, as it is at the moment, is changing, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yes. And, and so in the past, it was very, very difficult to do, to get an antisocial behaviour um, um, order. Uh, but it's been now broadened out, and rightly so, uh, because uh, the definition of antisocial behaviour, you know, isn't necessarily what you or I think. You know, rowdiness, drunkenness, all that sort of stuff, which we all would associate with uh, with students. It, it is about also doing behaviour that would cause uh, um, um, a disruption or whatever to both neighbours and to your fellow residents. That could be anything from uh, a, a, a tenant that uh, is playing, um, a student tenant's playing music too loud, but could it do with something like, that, you know, that they're stealing, they're stealing stuff out of the fridge uh, of their fellow tenants? Um, I know in certain, uh, certain uh, parts, Cardiff, for example, 
uh, one of the things that they came down heavily on students was not putting the rubbish out at the right day because they they didn't have bins, they had plastic bags, and therefore rats got into that. That's antisocial behaviour. And they, they came down really heavily, actually, on the landlord in Wales. You know, it, 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 it appears it's the landlord's fault that, that you know, the students are misbehaving in Wales. So um, they, that is why I think it's going to be very difficult for you to preserve that because the judge has got to make a, ju a judgment on what you would define as being antisocial behaviour versus what, what, what he and it, or somebody and, else made. And specifically on this point, it, I think it's worth pointing out that the, the wording in the bill is reverting to essentially having the ability to, to be antisocial. I, I yeah. forget the exact wording, but that, that's the generalism um, that it's saying. Now, I think I've said on previous webinars, um, I'm afraid, Glenn, Sean, and for myself, we all have the ability to be antisocial. Um, I'm, I'm yet to witness that, and I hope I never do. But of course, <laughs> we all have the ability to be antisocial. Um, and that broadness, I think, is extremely dangerous, especially in the student market. Because, again, going back to my fairness point, students have the right to, to live in a property and exercise the, the right to live there. Um, and, you know, depending you know, where you are and your location of your property, there may be ill, feel, Ill, Ill feeling that there is a high rise student accommodation smack in the, the middle of where you once lived when there wasn't. So all of a sudden you've got these different kind of um, motives, I think, going into play. And I'm interested, Glenn, from your perspective, how much of this you see, because um, Sean kind of alluded to a um, a view um, of, of, of students. Um, you know, I, I think I have that view of of most people, frankly. I think we could all act in and so and social, and I think we can all act really well. So I think it's not just about students in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. But what what are you seeing from a student behaviour perspective at the moment? And do you have many problems when it comes to anti-social behaviour? No, uh, it's very it's very little, in all honesty. But when it does happen, it does happen. Um, but I have to say that landlords typically, that when they have gone through the rigmarole of an HMO, licensing, getting their property up for this client group, ultimately they are thinking, what is the product I have to create? Just like a purpose-built student accommodation, this is why it's mad that it can be considered not relevant because they are looking at what is the product I need to provide for the student client group. So they are designing the property, the home around that, they are elevating the standards around that. They are considering the expectations of a new population of young people and what they need for the next 10 years to be comfortable in their student housing, to be productive at university and enjoy their living. So they're, they're considering all of these things, how to future-proof their property investment to appeal to this market. So they're already signing up for the slightly higher risk that there may be antisocial behavior because of that particular client group and the perception there may be a slighter higher chance of annoyance or nuisance or disturbance with neighbors perhaps. And therefore they themselves, if they're managing it themselves or their agent are very much geared up to managing that and, and ensuring the communications and, and well-being of students are looked after and, and those relationships with neighbors are looked after. So a landlord's not going to particularly be wanting to, for that student to exit because then they're going to be missing out on their, um, their, their finances. They're, they're going to be missing out on that. Um, and especially within this new framework, they, they could be having a void for 10 months. Um, no, that's a great point. That's a great point. And that's the difference right between, say, the, the more standard PRS and, and the student market is you haven't got this. <laughs> You haven't just got a load of students waiting on your doorstep every single month to take their property. It's cyclical. Um, and actually, you know, the, the, there's other motives there too. And um, Sonali actually says, good morning, Sonali. We have lots of cases of falling out between groups, stating bullying or emotional distress. How are you meant to monitor this to be qualified to gauge these as antisocial? It's so difficult for agents. I absolutely empathize with that point. And I'm sure you do too, too, too Glenn. You're probably living that actually uh, on, a, on a weekly or monthly basis. So I I think this is um, this is very much a, a minefield, and especially given your cyclical point there, which I think is is really really pertinent. Um, thinking ahead, um, you know, the position students take changes, and um, we've had a good question to this point um, uh, from Luke. Good morning, Luke. Um, what do we reckon would happen if, say, a student that originally moved then dropped out of their course and went to get a job? Would the whole household have to move out or do we have to enforce just one tent to vacate? Something worth thinking about. Now, I think that's a great question, a lovely segue actually into our last point on this, this, this Sean. But I think as um, just before we go, go to you, it's, it's worth again pointing out that from an assured tenancy perspective, um, as per my understanding anyway, Sean, so please correct me if I'm wrong here, 
um, the tenants are not joint and severally liable. Um, and therefore, actually, you, 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 we're not going to live under the same free framework as we had under ASTs. Am I right to think that, first of all? Yeah, that, that's my understanding of it. Yeah. 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 So, so that affects the, the dynamic again of how you deal with yeah. individual tenants, et cetera. But I think specifically to the point around the changing nature of somebody as a student or a non-student, um, what's your take on this and and, and how you know, things like council tax exemptions work alongside that? Well, see, this is this is the point, you know, you know, I, you're, the listener put that finger on it. You, you know, people do drop out of university, you know, and, and say, well, actually, I'm quite happy here I'm going to be working down the local weather spoons you know so but then you you, you lose any of the exemptions because you, you, your status changes so again how much enforcement will be on that and and what the effects of that will be I'm throwing it out there is this you know is this another unseen problem that the government actually hasn't seen and, and I suspect it is mm. but it'll be very interesting to hear what the uh the listeners and, and Glenn have to say this is a big problem or is it do you know what it will be widely dis- disregarded and mm. you know, the, the councils don't have the time to go around enforcing and checking what everybody's status is and checking their union cards, uh, their, their university cards. And then, but then there are a lot of authorities out there that would, are really, really strict on council tax. They're, they're strapped for cash as well. So any, anything that they can do to get their, their, their you know, their two penneth, they're, they're going to have a go at. And Glenn, you know, what are you seeing here? Are you, are you seeing, I, I imagine, this does happen and it happens really more than than people probably probably realize because um you know people go into university thinking it's going to be brilliant and then all of a sudden it isn't and, and they want to change do you see a lot of this and how do you manage it at the moment yeah and we're seeing more and more of it um and a lot of what we're seeing what we're seeing is some some dropouts and they they're, they're leaving uh university um and again, some of this could be around the escalation around mental health and it's banded around, it becomes cliche, doesn't it? But again, statistically, I, I read 35% of students now seeking mental health resources versus what it was 21% three or four years ago. So there's a massive trend in that way. This ripple effect also has an effect on relationships within groups who um are falling out um and therefore tenant swaps are sought because they're in a fixed term contract um and they are having to replace a tenant currently and we're having to deal with that so operationally that's a tricky thing for us and it's a tricky one to navigate because you're dealing with those relationships as well um but yeah i mean sean what are your thoughts on how that will work with tenants what i mean how does that work going forward well, uh, you know, technically, if you cease to be a student in a, a purpose-built student accommodation, you lose the right to live there. But because of this ambig- ambiguity uh, of the, uh, you know, in the private rental sector, you know, mixed ten years, you know, how is that going to be managed? You know, and actually, there may be even landlords out there that are operating the mixed uh, ten-year um, uh, uh, operations. I'd be interested to see how they cope with that. Mm. It might be, you know, there are, you know, young professionals are quite happy to live in a student-type accommodation in their early years in a mixed tenure. And how then would you, you know, do you, do you allocate that out? Yes, of course. If it's not joint and several, that you would start segmenting. Though know, you're exempt, you're not exempt, you're exempt. You're not exempt, so there, you know there's going to be that bureaucracy for both the local authorities and for the the, the, the landlords. And, and, and then there's some solutions, but you know I'm not sure that they've thought through what those are going to be in advance. No, agreed. And interestingly, Chris, uh, good morning, Chris, uh, points out that uh, uh, David Smith, uh, uh, a friend of Good Lord, and indeed these webinar series. I, in fact, I think he, he, he well, hopefully, we're joining through through the course of the next year as well to bring his thoughts, so we can ask him directly. But Chris suggesting David um, has 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 suggested that. If a group of say six tenants gave notice, that would mean the tenancy for the whole house is broken. Um, that means if a student falls out with their group, they can make the whole house homeless. So it is clearly we you know we need clearly defined um, uh, legislation here. We also I think as well need to understand what constitutes PBSA. And um, Paul, good morning, Paul says there doesn't appear to be a legal definition for PBSA. Could this cause problems? Um, I, I'm pretty sure it could. Yeah, it could cause problems because, and here's the point: any kind of um, any kind of grey area of legislation, I actually think, is not helpful because it's really going to wait to be tested until we all know where we stand. 
Uh, and so when, something that does feel like a give that feels like, oh, we can just call it PBSA and we can we, yeah, we can move forward. Yeah, that's going to be risky behavior. And I'm pretty sure most most professionals not in not in the, the game to be as risky as that, to, to be the first one to try and test something and then fail. So, you know, I think clarity is the underlying ask here uh, across many aspects of the renters of Bill, frankly, not just students. But there's so many aspects where, you know, the bill doesn't quite deliver on, on, on an understanding in practice um, and that's exactly what we're looking for, really, over the next two to three readings uh, moving forwards. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, let's move on to um, housing and shortages. Um, for anybody attending the um, the webinar today, who was also at Property Mart 1 earlier this week, um, you would have noted that from a lettings perspective, um, the major talking point was housing shortage. And I think it was absolutely right that they put that at the top of their agenda because it's what ultimately um, is driving a lot of the conversation um, uh, around um, the change in reform. Um, we've got a good view of um, what's happened in Scotland. Um, so, Sean, um, talk us through... Um, um, briefly, if you can, um, sort of what we're seeing in Scotland. And of course, bear in mind, reform has changed there um, ahead of ahead of England, as it has in Wales and Northern Ireland, actually. But focusing on Scotland, talk us through what we're seeing north of the border. Right. So, uh, you know, north of the border, you know, the major cities, the, the, the popular, the, the, uh, the population concentrates in Scotland are also where they have, uh, you know, some of the most thriving university uh, universities and across the board in Aberdeen, in uh, Glasgow, in, in in Edinburgh, there are shortfalls of anything up to thirty percent on 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 the amount of accommodation available for the students that are um, that, that want to go to those universities. Um, I, you know, and 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 some of the, the stuff, especially in Edinburgh, where they have built purpose built um, uh, accommodation, it tends to be slightly uh, well. In some cases, significantly more expensive than than what's been offered in the uh, in the private rented sector. But Edinburgh is also a great uh, tourist uh, place to go, and it's three hundred and sixty days a year. You know, people want to go and see Edinburgh, so a lot of the accommodation is now being turned into uh, short term lets because that is a more viable economic model for the landlord than than in the student uh, uh, sector. So what we are seeing is that the supply in Scotland is under pressure. That will have an adverse effect on the Scottish university system because eventually people will start to say, actually, we, uh, we're going to look uh, uh, we're going to look elsewhere for, uh, for university accommodation. Now, I know in Scotland they don't have the same levels of fees or, or they, they have so-called free education, but all the universities in Scotland rely on significant numbers, if especially English students going there. And if they can't get the accommodation, they are not going to go. They're going to find mm. alternatives. It's going to be great for you, Glenn, in Bath, um, people in Bristol and the other universities. You know, they're, they're, they're cutting their nose off to spite the fa their faces. And we've very much seen light for light pressure in the rest of the PRS in Scotland too, because of the legislative change that they're, 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 they've undertaken. And I think, um, and I would hope rather, um, that, you know, DLUC and uh, others are watching and learning from on the course of action there. It certainly feels things like rent controls, for example, which have been in Scotland, along with a a, a, a moratorium on, on evictions. It certainly feels that we're not going down that route. And I, I was very pleased to hear uh, that Lisa Nandy yesterday afternoon announced that Labour were not supporting rent controls. Um, that's been, a, I think, a general fear. Uh, and I think it's fair to, to say that there's definitely a challenge to the, the incumbent government in the next election. So I think it's worth us looking ahead and thinking about, you know, what changes come hereafter, even not just the ones that we're, we're kind of aware of today. Um, but Sean, you make a point around sort of Bath benefiting. I wonder whether that's actually a good thing. Um, so, Glenn, talk us through the Bath market. What's supply and demand like at the moment uh, from, from a student to landlord ratio perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's nothing like the 30% deficit you're talking about there, Sean, in Scotland. But nevertheless, there is a um, supply deficit. Um, and uh, and also, I think, um, yeah, well, my, my anxiety amongst the other agents and landlords is that this will encourage landlords to exit the market um and like you said sean that some will go into the holiday rental market um others will just sell up because actually they just don't want to have to deal with the logistical aspect of what is involved with this um so yeah i just think it's going to just put pressure on the universities on the students um 
And then for those landlords as well, what, what we don't, I think the other thing to remember here for landlords is so many of these landlords have got into this for so many different reasons. It might be it's for their pension. It could be, you know, for a future retirement. It could be because they actually um, have to replace an income because they don't have the capacity to work. There's so many different reasons of what their why is that they are a landlord. We we almost demonize landlords, don't we, sometimes, and think actually um, they're just the greedy landlords. But actually, they're serving our communities, and they are offering something incredible for our students. And I think if 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 they exit in droves, which anecdotally I hear quite a few will, it will affect that supply, no doubt. Yeah, I. I couldn't agree more with the, the demonization side of it. and it's easy as well for uh for sort of challengers to that point sit and say well you're all conflicted it's your business it affects you. the reality is take all the landlords out the out of the market where do people live and and what you know the, the unintended consequence of the growth of the PRS is actually in my view covering a a mass housing crisis in, in the last sort of 15 to 20 years. And if it wasn't for those investors coming in and actually putting money behind properties and opening those properties up to people, we would have a real problem. Um, and indeed, we're finding a precipice at the moment where that is potentially running out because people are more skeptical and look where we are. And you've only got to look and speak to letting agents today that have 30, 40, 50, 80 different applications on a single property within 24 hours of coming to market to know that those pressures are, are very, very real. So um, I think we should be we should be absolutely um, striving for a fairer PRS for tenants, but also for landlords and also for letting agents. And the, my my frustration with the the lack of letting agent engagement and notes within both the white paper and the bill is absolute because I think we're failing to realise the role that businesses like yourselves, Glenn, play, um, giving a better so a better service to both landlords and tenants. Frankly. Um, Rant over. Um, uh, we are we have run out of time. Um, uh, to, to back your point up before we go, Chris. Good morning, Chris. Says my daughter has chosen go to, has chosen to go to Manchester over Edinburgh, as she's worried about the lack of accommodation in Scotland. So anecdotally, right here this morning, somebody that is um, is, is making those choices. I'm sure that is Manchester's gain and Edinburgh's loss, Chris. Um, but but sad to hear that if that's where she wanted to go. And these are real pressures on on real people, right? Um, Thank you to everybody for attending, the hundreds of you that attended this morning. Um, I hope that was somewhat insightful. Again, we're going to be running these sessions concurrently with, with the performance and the progress of the bill as it goes through through Parliament and the House of Lords. Um, I really hope that you you look to join us in, in our next instalment. Um, to Sean and to Glenn, thank you so much for insights. Um, really interesting session uh, and really good to focus specifically on students um, uh, in, in, in this session especially. Uh, to everyone who joined, thank you for your time. I appreciate how busy you all are um, and look forward to seeing you all on the next webinar instalment. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, 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 Than